back, everybody. This is another episode of the Sovereign <coughs> God. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower. I'm joined with my good friend, Rabbi Stuart Federo. Hello, hello. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, a topic from a comment that I saw on one of my recent videos. Um, and basically the gist is, if someone rejects the New Testament, why, why accept the Torah? Why accept the Tanakh? We're going to delve into this a little bit. I actually think it's a great question. Right. And uh, before we get started, guys, hit that subscribe button, turn on the notifications, and give us both a big thumbs up if you like what we're doing here. Well, they can give us a thumbs up even if they don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Just don't hit the thumbs down. We don't want that. Right. No, no. <laughs> All right. So the question becomes, why Judaism? If you reject the Hebrew, if you reject the New Testament, then why don't you reject everything that comes with it? Okay. First, they're operating under a fallacy. Right. That they, a lot of people, Steve, believe that Christianity and Judaism are exactly the same, except Judaism doesn't happen to have Jesus. Mm -hmm. but, but but they're all the same. Or they will, <laughs> They will equally equally believe the erroneous idea that Christianity developed from Judaism, and therefore everything that's in Christianity is also in Judaism. Right. Which is equal, e equally wrong. You know, Judaism was around for 2,000 years before Jesus was dead and buried. So it, 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 if you want to condemn Judaism, learn about Judaism first— to see if what you think about it is actually true. Because if you give it half a chance, everything, you, the way I always word it is that when a person decides to leave Christianity, they only take one thing with them when they leave Christianity. And that is the misinterpretation, mistranslation, misunderstanding of Judaism that they learn from the Christianity they're leaving. They normally take the anti-Semitism with them too. That usually comes with it or is a part of the misunderstanding and misrepresentation. <clears throat> but but they don't realize that, you know how many people leave Christianity and wind up in Buddhism or Hinduism right, or, right. or some or some Eastern religion? They, they don't even give Judaism a chance because they think they already know it. And if they reject Christianity, they think they're also rejecting Judaism because they see them as one of the same. Right. And, and wrong on all counts. Mm hmm. <clears throat> but see, that's. That leads me into my first response to the question, why Judaism? Christianity supposedly bases itself on, on the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. And by the way, so does Islam. Yeah. Both Christianity and Islam will say to one degree or another, not 100%, but to one degree or another, they will say that the Hebrew scriptures is from God. Yeah. Yep. The the Christians will say that we are blind to the real message of it. Okay? The Islam will say that we perverted or changed it. Yeah. But they still will start with the idea that what we have in the text of the Tanakh is in fact from God. Right. Okay. So my point is that if a person believes let me rephrase that. If a person chooses to put their trust, their faith, I guess you would say, but trust is the word I prefer, in the Hebrew Scriptures, explicitly in the Torah, you can't conclude anything that you find in Islam, anything that you find in Christianity, anything you find in Hinduism, mm -hmm. anything you find, anything you find in, in Buddhism. Because the basis of the Hebrew Scriptures contradicts, certainly contradicts Christianity, okay? Mm -hmm. you know, e even though Judaism is far closer to Islam than Christianity could ever be close to Judaism. A as a, you, have, you have a car, okay? A car is a system. It has a gasoline-powered engine that makes circular motion. The circular motion is transferred to the wheels, making mm -hmm. the car move one direction or the other. It is a system in and of itself. Religion is a system in and of itself. 
Okay, and as a system, Judaism is far closer to Islam. It is incapable of being remotely close to Christianity. Right. Okay, and Buddhism and Hinduism and Buddhism on all sorts of other elements completely become outside what we find in the Torah, what we find in the Tanakh. Yeah, for sure. So taking Christianity, for example, all right, the, what, what is, what is, and we've talked about this on another show, but what is the basic theology of Christianity, okay, that Jesus died for your sin? Yeah. Okay. Yep. We don't have to look these up. People can look them up on their own. It's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Deuteronomy 32, verse 30 to 35. Moses has just responded to the people of Israel who have sinned with the golden calf. He oh, Exodus. does. Exodus. Exodus. What did I say? You said Deuteronomy. Exodus. Exodus 32, verse 30 to 35. Sorry. Okay. He says, the people of Israel have sinned. Maybe, maybe. I could atone for their sin. Right. He goes up to God and he says, forgive these people. If you don't forgive these people, blot me out of the book of life. We assume it's the book of life. It says the mm -hmm. book. Just blot me out of your book. Yeah. Right. But, well, that book could be who gets candy after des for dessert. <laughs> right. But the point of being blotted out of it is to be punished. Mm -hmm. So he, Moses yep. is saying, punish me for their sin. What's God's response? Doesn't Whosoever... Whosoever has sinned against me, he is the one I will blot out of my book. Okay? The one who commits the sin is the one who gets the punishment. Deuteronomy 24, 16. Every man should be put to death for his own sin. No one else can die for your sin. If everyone is put to death for his own sin, no one else can die for your sin. Okay? Right. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul that sins, it shall die. The son shall not bear the sin of the father, neither shall the father bear the son of, sin of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. It doesn't, yep. say, the, it doesn't say the wickedness of the wicked is on the righteous. It says the right. wickedness of the wicked is on the wicked. Exactly. Okay. Christianity believes that God became human being. That's, that is the hallmark of pagan faiths. Mm -hmm. Okay. They thought Pharaoh was a god. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, Every one of the plagues is against the gods of Egypt. The, the tenth plague was against the Pharaoh as the next god. Yep. And, and the firstborn became the priests of Priest. the next god. Yeah. So in one fell swoop, with the death of the firstborn, God is killing the next god and all his priests. Right. Okay. But God is God and humans are human. God does not become a human and humans don't become God. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie. Okay, if God Foundation. were a man, if God were a man, then like all other men, God too would be a liar. That's what that's saying. Yeah. Yep. Hosea 11, 9, for I am God and not a man. Ezekiel 28, 2, the punishment of anybody who thought they were God, claims to be God, that they'd, they'd, they'd get real hot water real quick. <laughs> right. Right. So, so the point is, is that the most basic elements of Christian thought is actually antithetical to what our Hebrew scriptures tells us. Right. They'll, Christians will say, oh, you got to have a blood sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin. No, you don't. If, a, if, mm -hmm. a, if it was an absolute necessity to have a blood sacrifice, if nobody could find forgiveness without it, then why in Leviticus 5, 11 to 13, would God say, if you can't afford the cheapest sacrifices, then right. bring, then bring, bring for your the, 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 the ephah of flour. Mm -hmm. Okay, if if blood sacrifice was a requirement, God would not allow anybody to bring the sacrifice of flour. Right. Okay. Is it and, Psalm Psalm fifty two? David outright says, uh, "Sacrifices you did not desire, so I'll bring exactly. them out it's of my in, lips." Also in Jeremiah, it's, it's yes. Uh, and and we could do a whole show, and we may have already well, done a whole show. Well, here's the, here's the deal, though, is in Psalm fifty two, the Mishkan was still standing. Sacrifices were happening all the time. Right. So anyone who uses the argument that Jews don't have their sacrificial system anymore, they had it when David wrote that. It was in effect and, when David and, wrote and, that. And more important, <laughs> more importantly, we don't need it. That, exactly okay, right. And that because there are it. other God ways to obtain, desire it. Uh, other, and there are other ways to obtain forgiveness without a blood sacrifice. Right. Okay. Uh, Jonah chapter three, 
God saw the works. What works? That they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil he said he would do to them. He did not do it. He forgave the people of Nineveh. What did the people of Nineveh do? They prayed, they fasted, and they stopped doing the bad and God forgave them. And were the people of Nineveh Jewish? Not, they, they weren't. And people could say, oh, well, they were never commanded to make a sacrifice. Well, wait a minute. If the only way to get forgiveness is a blood sacrifice, right. <laughs> they're, they're, they're admitting that God made them die in, and, and mm -hmm. in their sin. Right. God wouldn't have given them any way. God brings them into the world with, as sinners and then condemns them for being the sinners that God brought them in the world as. No. And, and Christianity normally explains itself as being the way the Gentiles were grafted into salvation, right? right. Well, in, in Jonah 3, we <laughs> see that Gentiles were already able to be forgiven of their sin. Without having been without a sacrifice, in. without grafting without in. Without a sacrifice. Exactly. Okay. Solomon builds the temple. The temple is the specific place where all the sacrifices are going to take place. And what, is, what does Solomon say, dedicating the very place where the blood sacrifices are going to be <laughs> right. offered right. in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 to 50? 1 Kings chapter 8, 46 to 50. What does he say? He says, they're going to come a time where you're carried away to the land of your enemies. Yep. All you'll have to do is face this place. That's why yep. Jews face east, face Jerusalem. Right. Okay, Face this place, repent of your sins, stop doing the bad, start doing the good, and God will forgive you. Yep. It's explicitly even, clear. Even says right out, you'll be a long time in the in the house of your enemies without a without a temple. Right. Without a king. Right. You know. And I like to um I always like to supplement Numbers twenty three nineteen. I want to say this verse is in First Samuel fifteen, but if I'm wrong, correct me. Uh, oh, sure. It says the strength of Israel is not a man that he can lie. Um, and it shows straight out one. Who's the God we're talking about? Israel. Where'd you, God. where'd you say that was? I think that's First Samuel 15, but I'm probably wrong. But I'm I'm almost positive it's in the book of First Samuel, though. Uh, but it says right out, the God that we're talking about is the God of Israel, of course. He's not right. a man. He cannot lie. You know, so anyone who says that they can reinterpret the scriptures better than the Jews can about you know, their own God, you know, you're, you're fooling yourself, you right. know? All right. Well, I, I can't find it real quick, but whatever Hold on. You, you said 15, what? Let me look. Okay. Glory of Israel. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. It's a uh, first Samuel 15, 29. Oh, I didn't make it that far. Okay. And also the glory of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Because men sin. If men sin, then even if God were a man, then like all other men, God too would sin and he would need to repent. Right. Exactly. Right. But I like right. to use that verse because it shows who's he the glory of? Who's he the, who's he the strength of? Mm -hmm. Israel. It's, it's right. clear. It's blatant. Right. You know? So the point is, is that the text of the Hebrew Scriptures contradicts the most basic elements of Christian theology. Right. About Jesus coming to earth as God, confusing God and man, dying for your sins, a human as a sacrifice, which God in uh, Deuteronomy calls a an abomination and something God hates, human yep. sacrifice. Yep. Uh, the basic elemental bottom line theology of Christianity contradicts the Hebrew scriptures. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... What else? Okay, <clears throat> there are there's very strong similarities between Judaism and Islam. Mm -hmm. Okay, as a system of religion, you? you know, Islam also has law as paramount. We call right. ours the halakha; they call theirs halal. Sharia. Sharia. Oh, oh, their dietary laws are halal. Sharia. Right, and and halal like hallelujah. Mm -hmm. A form of praising of God, okay, is uh, like our kosher, okay? Their slaughter, not the way the meat is prepared once the animal is slaughtered, but the slaughtering itself is basically the same thing as, as the Jewish uh, uh, kashrut. Right, right. They just okay. face Mecca, I believe. Uh, well, it's not where you face. It's how you 
that's how you do it. And right, that's, right. that is extremely similar. Okay. As a matter of fact, the truth of the matter is Jewish kosher killed meat is considered halal by Islam. Right. But because we do more to the meat than how we kill it, mm -hmm. halal meat is not considered kosher. Yeah. Right. We, we do a lot more. And there, there are other animals allowed in halal that aren't allowed in kosher. Right. And, and there's a lot more differences, but the but the similarities are clearly there. Right, right, definitely. We are a religion of law, they're a religion of law. We we have Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. They have Ramadan, which is a month long, mm -hmm. but, but it's still basically the same overview of a person's life and try to make the world a better place. We have tzedakah, they have zakat. Mm -hmm. They have the idea of taking a percentage of income and, you know, donating it either to the service of the temple or when the temple doesn't stand, it was altered slightly to be in terms of tzedakah. Okay. Right, right. All right. Tithing could be our own, one, a topic in and of itself, by the way, but we're not going to do that now. Okay. The, the difference is, is how we perceive God. Yeah. Okay. Basically, personal opinion. Okay. Take it for the grain of salt. Muhammad founded Islam and he became... He, he basically was a warlord, and therefore his image of, God, of Allah becomes like a warlord. Our mm. image of God is much more calm, compassionate, forgiving, not vengeful, not warlike. Okay, so there are, in fact, differences. All right. He, our Bible, what is, the, what is the main thing about Judaism's view of God? He's one. There's That's only odd. one God. Yep. Okay. Do you have any idea how many manifestations of Brahma there are in Hinduism? <laughs> right. Thousands. Right, right. Thousands. And and Hindus, no differently than Christians, will say that, well, it's the it's the uh, manifestation of only one God, which is Brahma. Mm -hmm. Christians say the same thing. Yeah. But if, if it comes down to it, do you think let me let me tell you a story. Okay, when, when we first moved to Houston, we were living in Missouri City. It's a suburb town of Houston. <clears throat> we had a, a magnificent, a wonderful neighborhood. We had tw 23 houses and 26 children. Okay, it was a very young, families moved in. Uh, we had a professional Astros baseball pitcher. We had just everything and everything you could think of in the, in the community, including a family that was from India, including that family who was also Hindu. And everybody used to play with everybody. And one day, they're all over at my house, and I noticed that the daughter of the Hindu family has a, uh, a T-shirt on, and there's an image of a person on her T-shirt. And I said, oh, who's that? And she said, oh, that's our God. And wait a minute. When it comes down to it, on a personal level, if families have their own personal God and they're not worshiping Brahma, they're only worshiping the manifestation of Brahma, what is that different than Christians worshiping Jesus, the manifestation of the, <laughs> the, right. the, you know, the Trinity or whatever? Right. Exactly. Okay. So, okay, uh, Buddhism, what is the basic design of Buddhism? Okay, it, it, Buddhism strikes me as very individualistic. It's the individual who wants to uh, meditate. It's right, the attain nirvana. Or what? For themselves. Right. Okay, Do, does uh, the pursuit of the meditative state lead a person to start a charity? Does it does where where does the rest of the world come into that? Right. Okay. Judaism, in all of my studies, never found anywhere where Judaism created a monastery, where where priests, rabbis would go to get away from the world. To the contrary, you know, a, 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 a rabbi, a, a man who was studying Talmud all day, all night, whatever still eventually had to go home and right. satisfy his wife, yeah. 
help his children. And in a lot of cases would start a would start an institution of learning in a lot of cases. But they wouldn't do it to the desertion of their spouses. Right. Okay. Right. The, the story is told of Akiba, but he was an exception. He wasn't the rule. And he still had to come home. Yeah. So, but Islam, start over. But Buddhism tends to be very individualistic. Mm-hmm. And right. How high of a level can I get myself in if, that if you, meditative if you, state? If, right? if you take a look at the writings of the Gautama Buddha, okay, um, what's the worst possible thing a person has? Desires. Hmm. So you're supposed to completely get free from your desires. And what does Judaism say about our desires? It's our desires that lead us to have families, to have wives, to have right, to have a home, to have a job. Right. Okay. You know, if I'm not supposed to have a desire, so I'm supposed to starve myself to death because to want to <laughs> eat and sustain my life is a bad thing. I mean, to what degree are you going to take it? Right. And you have a lot of that same overlap. Right. In a lot of the Western philosophical religions, um, Stoicism, all these Western Greek ideas, philosophy that are also imposed on Christianity, which is why you see this world being so such an evil place, and everything about it is evil and wrong. And, and what does and, God say in our Hebrew scriptures? And right. God saw that it was good. Right. Goodness has a has an overarching attribute of all of God's creation. Okay. In, can, in can, fact, can, in fact, I believe there are certain things that if if you do completely abstain from things that you know God has given you, that's equally as wrong. Well, I gave them to you. Taking according them. According you know? to Jewish tradition at least one tradition, not only is a person going to have to explain why he did do what he should not have done when he makes it to the afterlife, he is also going to have to show why he did not do what he was allowed to do. For example, for example, okay, a good meal. Am I supposed to say, I will not have a good meal? Okay, great Hasidic story of, of uh, the rabbi going to visit the uh, miser of the town and you know the miser says you know he comes over right at dinner time and the miser says you know you, you're here for dinner I, I have my uh, my uh, meal of bread and water and the rabbi looks at him like he's out of his mind and he says God gives you the the, the gifts at your disposal right, and right. you only and you only you only eat and drink bread and water. You're supposed to be having fine steak. You're supposed to be having fine wine. You're supposed to be enjoying, you know, all the pleasures that you're allowed to have, mm -hmm. okay? But to deny them is to, you know, if I come to you with a gift, Steve, okay, and, and I give you the gift and you and it's wrapped up and all pretty, and I come back a week later and it's still on the shelf wrapped up, how am I going to feel? Right. Okay? Right. My purpose Not is good. so you'll enjoy it. Exactly. Yeah. Same thing with God. So he says to the miser, you know, God gives you these things. You're supposed to enjoy them. So he comes home and, and the disciples, how did it go? What happened? Did you, you know, did, did you, everything go well with this guy? And the, the rabbi says, I had to tell him he had to eat steak and I had to tell him he had to eat fine wine. And they were like, why? And his answer is, as long as he eats bread and water, he thinks that the poor can get along eating rocks. Hmm. Wow. In other words, okay, we understand the pleasures of life because we've been, we've used them. Right. It, it's supposed to lead us to help others. And if you think you can get along with nothing, you won't help anybody. Right. A great Hasidic story. <coughs> so and I think, I think a biblical example of that same idea is um, the Nazir, the Nazarite. Um, if a Nazarite prolongs his vow and does not partake in wine, it's technically not a good thing because, you know, Steve, wine was given to you. Steve, right? if you actually pick up the Bible <laughs> and read the laws of the Nazarite, he's, he's abstaining from a haircut. Yep. Okay, what's the big deal about a haircut? How do you feel after you've had a haircut? Cleaned up, fresh, 
Feel exactly. good, look good, feel good, right? Exactly. So he's denying himself that feeling. He is denying himself any kind of thing related to the grape. Mm-hmm. Okay, which means wine. Okay, by the way, what did they drink back then? Water? Water would make you sick. The reason why you drank mm-hmm. water is because the reason why you drank wine is because it was pure. The alcohol killed right. any bacteria that might be in the liquid. Okay, mm-hmm. that, that's why France developed the whole wine uh, 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 industry because their water system really wasn't that great. Okay, beer, same thing. It, 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 it you know, means you can drink the water. Okay, right, right. But but wine also gladdens the hearts of man. Yain yismachet lev adam. Okay, so, and the other thing is they can't get near a dead body. Yeah. Okay, so they're abstaining, they're refraining from joy, they are staying away from things that can pollute, okay? Mm -hmm. When it's over, what do they do? They, among other things, they have to bring a sin offering. And the commentary says, a sin offering, they're refraining from all these things. What was the sin? And the answer is, (laughs) the sin was refraining from enjoying the gifts God gives us. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, so my point is, is that Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, if they are compared with the Hebrew scriptures and the thrust of what Judaism is all about, they're going to fall short. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, that doesn't answer the question. That really doesn't answer the question. Why Judaism? And I can only give you my answer. If you take a look, and I would urge anybody to do so, go look at the spiritual autobiographies of people who convert to Christianity and compare them with the spiritual autobiographies of those who convert to Judaism. Right. When a person converts to Christianity, what do they say? What's the thrust of what they're, what's the thrust of what they are saying? I'm saved. I was a bad person. You know, it, it's all emotional. Mm-hmm. Okay. They, they've had problems in their lives. They've had addictions and Jesus took them away from their addiction. I would argue replacing one addiction with another, but that's another issue. Okay. They, they, they talk about how, you know, they, they felt such enormous guilt from something they did or didn't do. But Jesus took away the guilt. It's always emotional. It's always about their feelings. <laughs> Nothing right. more than feelings. Right. Okay. <laughs> but if you compare that with the spiritual autobiographies of those who converted to Judaism, what do they say? They say it's logical. They say it makes sense. Uh-huh. They say it's reasonable. They say it's rational. They say it's a religion that is practicable. It's a practical, practicable religion. Right. And I think that bears discussion. Okay. You know, what, what is the whole purpose of, of Judaism? What, what is the purpose of Judaism? It's to take the profane, the mundane, the common, and the everyday and sanctify it by making it holy. So, for right. example, so, for example... I I wash my hands before I eat. When I wash my hands, everybody washes their hands. What's the big deal about washing the hands? But I recite a blessing, thanking God for commanding me to wash my hands. I I have taken the mundane, common, everyday act of washing my hands, and now I have elevated it. I brought it up to the ethereal because I am invoking God in it. Right, right. Okay. A friend of mine, a friend of mine is a convert. He converted within the last two years. He actually said one, one of the most spiritual, one of the most spiritual things he does every day is when he washes his hands. Mm-hmm. Because it it takes the mundane and makes it holy, set apart, different, distinct. Mm-hmm. It's not that I'm just washing my hands. It's I'm washing my hands because I have a relationship with God who commands me to wash my hands. Right. And washing people go washing their hands. What that's so mundane and silly. Right. Well, is it? <laughs> is it? We'll talk about that in a minute. 
Okay. Um, you read these spiritual autobiographies, they will also indicate what Judaism has done for them. Okay. You, you know, they, they study more. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's an intellectual pursuit. It's not an emotional pursuit. Right. Actually, you're engaging your mind a lot more. You're engaging sure. your mind. Okay. They they talk about. Uh, okay, let me put it this way. If a kid is given a discipline from the moment he is born, is he going to be more likely to succeed, or is he going to be less likely to succeed, or it doesn't matter? If he's given a discipline, more yes. likely to succeed. I believe he's more likely. So let's talk about keeping kosher. You know, people forget that religions have an effect on the person who practices them. Oh, for sure. Well, you'd be surprised how people miss this fact. But a child who has been taught from very young age, we don't eat pig, might get invited to a friend's birthday party where they serve pepperoni pizza. And he will have the intestinal fortitude. He will have the guts to say to the mother, I can't eat this. It's got pig in it. You think that child is going to have a better life? You think that child is going to be better enabled to say to a drug pusher, Right. I don't take that stuff. Because they've already developed the inner guts, intestinal fortitude to say no. Okay. You know, (coughs) Steve, I'm working on a book. Okay. We'll, We'll talk more about it later. But I talk about these uh, advantages. If you take a look at any one commandment, any one mitzvah, any mitzvah will fall under one or more of four categories of Jewish law. And the categories are categories of motivation. What will get you to keep kosher? What will get you to light candles on Shabbat? What will get you to keep the Sabbath? not work? What will get you to hang mezuzot on your doorposts? Okay? These are categories by motivation. What motivates a person to do so? And you do a survey of people, you're going to find that their reasons for doing something are not always the same, but they'll usually fall under one or more of these four categories. The first one, of course, is because it puts God in their lives. When I recite a blessing, thanking God for commanding me to wash my hands, to eat bread, to eat a meal, to do all the things we do in a given day, I am invoking God. I am bringing God and my relationship with God into my life. So doing Judaism gives you a sense of what is holy. If I, and, and you remember what I said, one or more of these four categories? Yeah. Okay. Another category is the ethical. Yep. Okay. I know that when I eat a hamburger, I know that the animal that was killed for that hamburger had to be killed according to Jewish law. And I know that one of the intents of that law is that the animal, if you're going to have to kill the animal just to sustain yourself, at least be humane when you kill it. As humane as possible. Right. Right. So I I am learning how to treat animals by my observance of keeping kosher. It's the ethical, Hmm. okay? I I know the Bible explicitly says that if I have pets, if I have animals, if I keep any animals, they get fed before I do. Right. If cattle need to be milked, okay, you can't skip them on Shabbat. You still have some work to do for that cow, okay? You you know, there are things that Jewish law teaches us in terms of the ethical in how to treat other human beings and how to treat animals, okay? So one is God and the holy, putting holy in your life. One is the ethical, gives you a systematic way to ethically treat everyone else, okay? Okay. Uh, Keeping Judaism makes us gives us a connection with something larger than ourselves. Okay, I know that when I study the Torah portion for this Sabbath, Jews all over the world are doing the same thing. Mm-hmm. I, am, I am connected to them. 
when, when I when I take ugh, okay when when I when I take a commentary okay look how things when I take a commentary and I study it I am in a conversation with somebody who lived hundreds of years ago right okay I I when I learn okay and, and another advantage of Judaism is that it makes learning extremely important mm-hmm. Pri- prioritizes learning. Not only, by the way, for adults, not only, by the way, for men, also for women, also for daughters, also for sons. Yep. Okay. So when, when, when I study, I am having a conversation with a generation that came before me, maybe many generations before me. So I am part of something larger than myself when I do Judaism. That is called the national. Okay. A person can say, why do I keep kosher? Because I remember my grandmother did, and I want to feel connected to her. National. It right. doesn't necessarily mean part right. of a nation. It means connected to something greater than yourself. But it's also the national, because the whole nation of the Jewish people are doing these things. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, yeah. you're connected. You're, you're, not, you're not alone. You have, you have a large group to be in contact with. Okay? And the final category of Jewish law, by motivation is it, it's reflexive. If I do it, I get an inherent benefit out of doing it. If I don't do it, I don't get the benefit. A mezuzah on the doorpost. What's the purpose and function of a mezuzah on the doorpost? That you will see it and remember and keep my commandments and be holy to your God. Like a string wrapped around your finger to remind you to do something, a mezuzah on the doorpost is to remind you to keep the commandments. It is a physical physical reason to exist right okay well if i put up the mezuzah i get the reminder to keep the commandments if i don't put up the mezuzah i don't get the reminder to keep the commandments <laughs> okay keeping kosher is the same thing and remember some people will have one motivation some will have others some will have more than one some will have all four some will have only one some will have three two you see what i'm saying mm-hmm but something so important to Judaism and Jewish identity as keeping kosher will, of course, fall under all four of the categories. Okay, God commands me to eat meat that is slaughtered according to Jewish law. Okay, God commands me to consider the feelings of my animals. Yodeyat Sadiq at Nefesh Behemato. The truly righteous person even considers the feelings of his animals. Loose translation. Right, right. Okay. Uh, the, the soul of his animals. Okay. By the way, that answers the question, does Judaism believe animals have souls? Yes, they're just not human souls. Nefesh behemato, the, the soul of his animals. A truly mm-hmm. righteous person will even consider the souls of his animals. At any rate, uh, so keeping kosher teaches me the ethical. Keeping kosher connects me with God who commands me to keep kosher. Keeping kosher connects me with the people who were commanded. That's the national. Yep. And if I keep kosher, I get a discipline that will help me in many things. If you're disciplined in one thing, you'll be a, you'll, you'll have an advantage in many things. If you're disciplined in nothing, you'll succeed at nothing. <laughs> wow. So I think there's a lot of reasons why I would choose Judaism. Okay? Tell me something. Who is going to have more respect for the law of the land? Someone who was taught from birth that the law is a curse? Someone who's taught mm-hmm. from from birth, that the only purpose and function of the law is to tell you you cannot keep the law and therefore you better go run to your Jesus? Or someone who's told to respect the law, that you have to keep the law. The law was commanded, that the law was beneficial for the people who follow it. (laughs) Who's going to stay out of jail more often? Those who are taught the law is a good thing. You need to keep it. It's ethical. Exactly. Okay, but people who are taught that the law is a curse, the law is something bad, okay, is going to wind up in jail more often. So, you know, there, there are all sorts of reasons to choose Judaism. And we've only listed partially right. some of them today. Mm-hmm. But if a person's leaving Christianity, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Don't throw out the Hebrew scriptures with the Christian's New Testament. Okay, read the Hebrew scriptures on your own, preferably with someone who knows something about them. <laughs> right. Okay. And, 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 you know, 
give Judaism a chance. Don't condemn it just because you learned to condemn it by your Christianity that you left behind you. Right. And and I would argue, as we did with the first part, that Judaism, if, if you're going to accept the new, the he, if you're going to accept the Hebrew Scriptures, okay, that alone precludes believing in Christianity or Islam or Hinduism or Buddhism. Right. And right there covers what three quarters of the earth, eighty percent of the world's population, with those four religions: Buddhism, mm -hmm. Hinduism, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Right. You know, God in the Bible, God tells us God didn't pick the Jews because we were the most numerous. God picked us because we were the smallest. Why? Why does that make sense? Steve, you got a business. You're trying to, you're, you're running, right? Right, right. In your opinion, would you choose an advertising agency that has a hundred other clients? Or would you choose an advertising agency that only has you as a client? Just me. Why is one better than the other? Because they can devote all their time to me. Bingo! And not start believing in other gods. Right. So the, the raison d'etre of the Jewish people is that we are supposed to be the advertising agents for God. God mm -hmm. isn't, didn't choose us because we're the most numerous. God chose right. us because we're the smallest. Right. Because then we can devote our efforts to just one client, namely God, and our relationship with God. Right. And I think another important point on that topic is also that the preservation of Israel can't be contributed only to their own devices, you know, but it has to be miraculous. You know, Hashem preserves Israel, not because they're so numerous, but because they are so small in number, you know? Right. I mean, even Mark Twain acknowledged that. Like he, he says right out, uh, I'm trying to think of what the name of his book was, what the name of that, I think it was just a short little article he wrote, but, um, who is this? Mark Twain. Oh, uh, on why why the Jews? Yeah, right. Yeah, at the He's end, like, he so says, small in number, yet they outlast every great Everybody nation. Everybody who comes up against them. Yep. At the very end, he says, "What is the secret of their survival?" God. <laughs> it's God. Yeah. Right. Okay, I want to find something real quick. I think it's here, but where would it be? Uh, Uh, bingo. I want to read something to you. Okay. This was published in a Jewish magazine. Oh, my God. 40 years ago. <laughs> 1983. Okay. Why I Chose to Become a Jew by Gail Seville. Born Jews often find those who choose Judaism baffling. To those who ask me why I converted, I often feel like answering, my gosh, don't you know why? Isn't it obvious? Well, obviously it isn't. I will try to explain my reasons for choosing to be a Jew. I find great comfort in Judaism. <clears throat> Jewish children are born innocent. And even though they bear the awesome responsibility of upholding the ideals and standards of their people, of living a moral and decent life, of serving as a spiritual example to the other people of the world, Jewish children are not born with the burden of guilt. They do not come into this world tainted with original sin, but rather blessed with original purity. They are not created through an act which is sinful and ugly, but which is beautiful and holy. And as they grow up, their blood relatives, congregational family, and environment continually reaffirm their innate holiness, their ability to do good and achieve moral purity. Their best qualities are always encouraged. When I was very small, she writes, I often wondered how God could possibly think I was so terrible. I was too young to have done something wicked enough to make God mad at me. It is a comfort now to learn that God thought highly of me all along. There are no intermediaries between Jews and God. Jews believe that all people have close personal access to God. As a Jew, I don't have to go through an ecclesiastical switchboard, secretary, or vice president in charge of human affairs to reach God. Having the knowledge that a direct line is always open makes me feel secure. Another matter of personal responsibility could be added here. A few friends have expressed to me their regret that we Jews have no human savior, no one to take on the burdens of our sin for us. My answer to them is thank God. When I am in a car, I do not like riding in the passenger seat, putting my life in someone else's hands. 
I prefer controlling my own destiny. I prefer to earn my own reward. I am not saying that such a tremendous responsibility does not sometimes scare me. It does. But this is the ultimate in personal freedom. And there are few gifts more precious than that. Being able to choose how we live means that the good that we do with our lives counts. Being Jewish means that I can earn my own reward through the commandments. In Judaism, a life well lived means something. It has value because it is dearly earned not because it is bestowed through some intangible act of faith. I find security in knowing that I personally have control over what eventually becomes of me. There is also security in knowing that as a Jew, I am part of a people and a way of life that has survived and will survive. Nothing so life-affirming, so family and people-oriented, with such strong roots and widespread branches, can ever cease to exist unless humankind itself ceases to exist. As a Jew, I feel secure as a part of something very special and in a very real sense, immortal. Choosing to be a Jew is choosing to be totally alive because there is no way of life so deeply immersed in life, so concerned for life Mm. in the present and not in the world to come. Our festivals, rituals, and folklore enrich our faith but they are not its foundation. If Judaism were suddenly stripped of the holidays we observe, the legends we tell, the songs we sing, much as it was in the bleakest times of Jewish persecution, I know that our heart would remain undamaged. Our essence consists of the fundamental values and ideas of humanity, truth, justice, and compassion. Finally, I find great joy in Judaism. I was raised in South Florida, she writes, which in the 50s and 60s, had a substantial Jewish population. My mother, who was a Judeophile, made certain that we were always involved with the Jewish community. When we needed an automobile mechanic out of a dozen service stations, my mother found the one run by the Greenblatt brothers. For our (laughs) medical needs, she located a Dr. Rothfeld, and for an employer, a Mr. Cohen on Miami Beach. And when Passover came around, we attended the Seder of our friends, the Konigsbergs. By the time I was four years old, I already had instilled in me great love for the Jewish people. Despite my Christian grandparents' efforts to the contrary, I grew up feeling very much a part of the community. It was not until I was older that I was led to believe, with great disappointment, that one did not, could not, choose to be a Jew. You were either born one or you weren't, and that was that. I was told that I had as much a chance of being a Jew as I did of becoming an Afro-American. And so I regarded my Jewish friends and neighbors with envy. Even though life often dealt them tragic blows, they nevertheless seemed to enjoy life. In the worst of times, there was always an undercurrent of home, happiness, warmth, and humor. I think I have finally figured out why Jews always seem to enjoy living so much. It comes from knowing that life is a precious but fleeting gift that must be lived to the fullest before it is lost. It comes from knowing that life is a balance of good and evil, life and death, sorrow and joy. Bad does not exist without good, nor death without life, nor sorrow without joy. To me, this means that for every fear, there will be comfort, for every defeat, a victory, for every tragedy, a triumph, and for every heartbreak, a blessing. I find joy in knowing that as a Jew, I am promised justice and mercy from God, not threatened with eternal damnation. Our capacity for decency, morality, and holiness is emphasized. And while the dark and evil side of our character is not denied, we are not condemned for it. God tends to us with a firm and loving hand, not a whip. From this knowledge comes great joy. I hope I have answered at least a little the why of my choosing Judaism. But I have not yet answered the what now. We Jews by choice come from many different backgrounds and experiences, but I believe we all share the feeling that somehow we have always belonged with the Jewish people sharing in its destiny. Mm. We were aliens everywhere else. Whatever the diversity of our pasts, we share one fundamental goal, to achieve Jewish identity without having had the richness of the born Jews heritage bestowed by parents and grandparents. In the early 19th century, the Duke of Marlborough was raised to the peerage by Queen Anne because of his extraordinary service to the British crown. One day while the Duke was at court, a highborn nobleman decided to taunt him about his lowly origin. 
The nobleman turned to the Duke of Marlborough and said, Your grace, tell me, whose descendant are you? <laughs> to that, the Duke of Marlborough calmly replied, My dear sir, I am not a descendant. I am an ancestor. This, then, is my goal, to be the beginning of a long line of devout Jews. My hope is to pass on to those who come after me the love I feel for my new people to help to ensure the continued survival of a very special and essential part of humanity to do the best that I can with my gifts in the service of Jews and non-Jews alike. Wow. If you really want to be inspired about Judaism, if you really want to understand why people convert to become Jews, read the spiritual autobiographies of people who become Jews. Right. And there, go, go to YouTube. Go to YouTube and just type in the search bar for YouTube, convert to Judaism, okay, or convert to Judaism, and you'll come up with a wide variety of people who converted to Judaism, but you'll hear a theme that's very common. It makes sense. It's rational. It's reasonable. It's practical. It's practicable. And that's what I would say to the person, why Judaism? Not just because our Bible, the whole world tells us that our Bible comes from God, even if they disagree with certain things. Mm -hmm. Our Bible tells us why we should disagree with their religions, because it doesn't follow what our Bible says. Right. But there are advantages and effects on the person who follows Judaism that are positive and wonderful. That, that would be my answer to the person who left the... Uh, you right. left the uh, the uh, comment. All right. Okay. Rabbi, that was that was beautiful, inspiring, teared me up a little bit. Well, that um, that was her. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. But everybody, <laughs> Rabbi Stuart Federo, author of Judaism and Christianity: A Contrast. Uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, I have thank the you. link. Thank you for remembering to do that. Yes, of course. The link for this book will be in the description of this video. So. All right. Okay. And by the way, that was Gail Seville, Why I Chose to Become a Jew from 1983. Wow. So not quite 40 years ago. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. Yep. Great show, Rabbi, as always. I always hope so. I hope that at we least answers a little bit of a question um, <laughs> for anyone who might be asking this exact same question. We try our best. Right. Uh, but yeah, as I said, the link to his book is in this description, as well as others. Uh, Amazon, pick up a copy. I'm sure he would appreciate it. I would appreciate it. Uh, but as always, guys, um, if you have any questions, find us on Facebook. Shoot us an email. We're always happy to talk to you. Yep. We're here for you. Uh, if, if there's one thing I can say about Rabbi Federo, it's that he always makes himself a resource for anybody who has a question. If I can help, as, well, uh, Steve, as you've heard me say, any way I can help or any way I can help confuse you even more. Yeah. <laughs> but all right, guys, this was another episode of Rediscovering God. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.